Hello, everybody. Welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Today, we have special guests from IBM, from the Cloud Pack for Applications team. We have David Harris, who's an offering manager for Accelerators, and Chris Bailey, who's chief architect for Cloud Native Solutions. And they're going to be talking about IBM Cloud Pack for Applications and the new Accelerators for Teams. So, and stick around for the Q&A afterwards, and please post any questions in the chat. Thank you. Please, David. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is doing uh, as well as can be expected in these times. Uh, my name is David Harris. Uh, I'm an offering manager for the Cloud Pack for Applications. and In particular, I focus on a set of capabilities and content that we call accelerators. Uh, all with the aim of simplifying the development and delivery of building cloud native applications in the enterprise. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague Chris Bailey, uh, who's chief architect for this. Uh, he'll be on the, the Q&A helping out uh, as I'm presenting and afterwards as well. So I'd like to start by giving a bit of context around the Cloud Pack for Applications, uh, the motivation for the approach that we've taken with this offering, uh, and ultimately what's in the box. Uh, but I'll focus primarily on, as I say, the development of cloud native solutions, uh, including some tech preview enhancements we've recently delivered in version 4.2. Uh, if the demo deities are with us, I will hopefully show you some of this in action. Uh, we should leave some time for, for Q&A at the end as well. So broadly looking at the application space today, we, we kind of see these three challenges fairly, fairly ubiquitously across enterprises. Uh, and in a way, they're very familiar, but perhaps they have some nuances in, in the new world of hybrid multi-cloud. Uh, so that's namely, how can you deliver faster? How can you, how can you contain operational costs, which are ever increasing? And partly what's causing that high cost is the complexity that we're seeing uh, as enterprises are also adopting this, this transformational journey that they're on from from legacy applications and methodologies towards uh, the cloud native platform. And what does all this mean? Uh, obviously, there are a lot of different viewpoints on this. Um, I've, I've called out one here. This is uh, an analyst report from the IDC. Uh, you can kind of see on the left some of the stats that they're calling out that over the next few years, we are going to see an increase in cloud native development for applications. Um, we're going to see a huge increase in the number of uh, daily deployments. And that's kind of driven by more broad adoption of DevOps practices. And all of this is ultimately underpinned by this great shift we've seen towards deployments on containers. Um, and on the right hand side, they kind of talk about the need for a deployment and development platform, which helps you build these applications which can run across distributed infrastructures that it talks about this concept of an application stack to provide uh, those cloud native capabilities that we think of like elastic scalability, uh, the operational concerns. And key to all of this is, is a microservice development or like a microservice architecture for development um, and key technologies emerging such as Docker containers and Kubernetes. Uh, and we're going to talk in this presentation about how through accelerators, hopefully we can drive towards this future state where teams are more efficient. So we, we kind of believe with the Cloud Pack for Applications that any, any successful application strategy requires you to be able to, to balance your investments. So to be able to deliver those, those new experiences for your customers, um, more rapidly and not be not be disrupted by uh, new companies emerging in your in your industry, um, but that you also have this existing investment and those those business critical applications that you need to keep running. Um, they need to stay on supported versions of software, and for some of them, you will also want to to unlock more value in them. So, how do you bring them into a containerized world? How do you provide APIs so that they can be leveraged by your, your new cloud native applications? And with, with the Cloud Pack for Apps, basically what we want to try and do is to provide everything that you need for today and what you will need tomorrow. And it would be very rude for me to not mention OpenShift in an OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, so across our, our portfolio, we've been going down a container-based direction for quite some time now. Uh, specifically a, a Kubernetes-based direction. 
Uh, we see containers as kind of the practical way of achieving multi-cloud portable workloads and Kubernetes as that way to have a common management and orchestration for those workloads. Uh, together, IBM and Red Hat have contributed to almost every part of the Kubernetes platform. Uh, and we, we do truly believe that building this in the open has been critical to both the breadth of the ecosystem that's built up and the rapid pace of innovation and adoption uh, that we've seen around these technologies. Uh, but we also see that what's crucial to our customers in particular is that it's, it's the integration of that innovation into a coherent, secure, and supported offering. Um, and that's why IBM in particular has really doubled down on OpenShift as the foundation for our cloud pack strategy, uh, where we deliver a common experience for all of our solutions now. This is kind of our, our bill of materials for what's in uh, Cloud Pack for Apps at the moment. Um, as you can see on the top left, we have the licenses for those traditional runtimes, uh, the, the familiar WebSphere family of products and JBoss EAP. Uh, in the bottom left, we have a rich set of modernization tooling to help you unlock the value in those investments. So this can help you analyze binaries and start to move towards containerized deployments. And on the right hand side, which is what we'll talk about today, is how to develop cloud native like new applications. Uh, so this includes the OpenShift platform, uh, the complete set of IBM and Red Hat runtimes, developer tooling, and this, the set of capabilities that we've called accelerators for teams. Uh, coupled alongside this, Cloud Pack for Apps has this, uh, this concept of a ratio table within its license that basically allows you to repurpose your entitlement over time at a pace which suits your particular company's modernization journey. So when looking towards cloud native, uh, we kind of see enterprises having to face two challenges at once. Namely, how do they deliver faster, um, but how do they retain enterprise governance? And solving these at the same time can be quite challenging. We started doing some, some research and some interviews with some of our clients. And this was a, this was a developer journey for uh, an EU bank, and what they were basically telling us was that it was quite typical that it would take 90 days to develop and deploy a new solution. And as you can see from this, the emotional journey that this developer's on is not a particularly pleasant one. Uh, and a lot of time is getting spent bogged down just getting set up, getting infrastructure and onboarded, um, and actually getting configuration and integration right. Um, we saw this particularly as they were starting to move those applications out of development uh, into staging and production environments. And what we'd like to do with accelerators is to transform this cycle into one where a developer truly feels productive for like the whole time that they're engaged on the project. And this is our notion that we want to take that 40 days into a matter of hours um, through the ability to kind of codify the decisions that were being taken um, and handoffs that were being made between teams. So what we try to do with accelerators is to enable multidisciplinary teams. So that is anyone with a vested say in how a solution ultimately gets delivered to collaborate and codify their decisions so that developers are empowered and safeguards are in place so that issues aren't encountered further down the line. And we provide content and capabilities um, across the full SDLC um, so starting on the left, like how do folks actually design um, and ideate around a cloud native solution to solve a business problem? Um, we provide a set of content with the IBM Garage. So these are services organization uh, who have best practice agile principles. Um, they have a set of proven out reference architectures and we've built exemplar applications using those and the cloud pack for applications. Uh, we provide a collaborative solution development tool, which helps development teams actually be productive much faster. And ultimately, this allows us to uh, automate day zero, if you will, as well as capabilities to ensure that you've, you've got true CICD and speed of delivery and day two operation, like observability and maintenance. So it's not just day zero, it's, it's everything for the lifetime of this application. Now, the core set of capabilities that we have been working on um, across version four of Cloud Pack for Applications um, are application stacks, uh, developer tooling to help create applications with those stacks, 
and tool chains to facilitate the building and deployment of those applications in a governed way. Uh, starting with developer tooling, uh, we kind of recognize that it's important to let developers use the tools and IDEs that they love. Um, so we have always tried to take a flexible approach. Um, where we have had to introduce new concepts like the application stack, we're, we're making sure we're supporting developers use them in an easy way. Um, we've been working very closely with Red Hat on this to have a consistent um, opinionated view on how folks should be developing cloud native applications. Um, so whilst we had initially started with a CLI, uh, which we'd open source called Appsity, um, we've recently announced that we started to move towards Odoo and in future we'll provide the same capabilities through Odoo instead. And this is one of the examples of where we're starting to converge on technology choices. Um, looking now at application stacks themselves. So the best way to kind of think of these is a best practice technology stack for containerized applications. Uh, so this will include a particular runtime and framework. Um, we support the full set of IBM Red Hat runtimes here. So you can see Open Liberty, uh, the new Quarkus runtime, the JS, Spring Boot. Uh, they include common operational capabilities. So for example, health checks, so that an application can be automatically restarted. Um, we include endpoints for monitoring and for open tracing. The stacks themselves are semantically versioned for uh, auditability and control of updates. Uh, we provide a lot of labels on the actual deployed artifacts so that you can trace back to where this application has come from. And this allows a, an enterprise to kind of deploy and manage these applications at scale. They are, of course, completely customizable. So they are a starting point, but obviously we recognize that you may want to change a particular technology choice based on something that you're already using, um, or you would like to provide a stack which better suits a, a particular workload type, shall we say. Um, and one way that you can do this is through this concept of stack inheritance. So stacks can build on previous levels of stacks, and you can gradually abstract um, concerns away from the application developer so on the left, we kind of have like this, this base stack for, for Node.js, which is very similar to an S2, S2I approach, uh, where you package your application in a best practice Docker file um, within what we call the cloud native stacks, uh, such as Node.js Express. This is where we include um, a pre-configured Express server, uh, which has those endpoints I mentioned for uh, metrics, monitoring, health, things like that. And you can even go a step further. We don't include this in Cloud Pack for Applications, but we've prototyped it in open source, uh, where you can basically provide a functions as a service like programming model by including uh, the connect middleware. So a developer just has to write um, a request handler effectively. And one of the great things about this is it also allows for much easier maintenance. So for example, if I wanted to bump the version of Node.js in that base stack from 12 to 14, um, the any stacks which extend that would also be updated. So the Node.js Express stack and all those applications built from either would just have to be rebuilt to get that update. Uh, finally, we'll take a quick look at the pipelines that we provide. So we provide a set of pre-configured tasks. Uh, it's all best, based on Tekton running on OpenShift pipelines. Uh, that can easily be uh, triggered through webhooks and GitHub uh, to set up CI CD workflow. And one of the great things, or one of the reasons that we chose Tekton in particular is that it's, it's a Kubernetes native technology, uh, which allows for a much more consistent approach in how you manage your overall technology stack for, for application development and deployment. Uh, we provide a set of capabilities for uh, running tests, for linting, for signing images, and for verifying that the development stack that someone has chosen to use is one that is approved uh, for the particular deployment environment that you're targeting. So I'd now like to talk to some of the tech preview additions that we've made, and this is where things get quite interesting. 
So as I mentioned, we look to provide content which spans across the full SDLC and that truly enable multidisciplinary teams to collaborate and build solutions. Uh, the most recent capabilities that we've added are to help architects and business owners in particular lay out a cloud native application topology of multiple connected microservices and backing services that can solve a, a business problem. Uh, whilst continuing to ensure that developers are productive and that these solutions can be delivered quickly. And we're starting with kind of the fundamental building blocks for those solutions. So namely microservices which communicate over REST and microservices which are event-driven. So reactive microservices perhaps using a technology such as uh, Apache Kafka. So I'd like to walk you through the, the workflow that we have with these. So we start off with uh, what we provide for the garage as best practice reference architectures. We actually bring this into um, this workflow. We have the best practice application stacks for creating applications. Uh, we deploy through a series of operators, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, Clients can work either with the garage or entirely using the, the on-demand materials that they have through things like the Cloud Architecture Center. Uh, and a solution architect and business owner can start to collaborate in this tool we call Solution Builder. Uh, this allows them to load those reference architectures to learn from or, or start from scratch as a blank canvas and drag components onto it uh, to design their intended solution. They can then generate that topology. And what this will do is set up all the, the Git repos for the microservices, as well as GitOps repos for configuration. I'll, I will talk a little bit about GitOps in a moment. We set up the, we provide the build pipelines so that you can go from the, the microservice source code to the GitOps repository, which will have the uh, the built image ready for deployment. And we also provide the deployment pipelines and the operators so that you can actually run those applications on OpenShift. And these will automatically connect to each other. They will be viewable in the OpenShift topology viewer. Uh, they will basically paint as green before an application developer is even involved. When they do get involved, uh, they simply have to check out the, the respective GitHub repo they can start to commit their changes. Those will trigger and um, build and deploy pipelines. And of course, operations aren't ignored from this. They have full control of how things get deployed through that um, configuration as code approach with GitOps. I did promise I would talk a little bit about GitOps. So this is a, a methodology which is starting to emerge. Um, WeaveWorks, I believe, coined the term and do have a very good blog if you'd like to find out a bit more about it, but effectively it, it is configuration as code. Um, and it allows you to record your intended state for a Kubernetes deployment within your source code repos or within um, source code control so that you have that audit trail. It's very easy to do uh, rollback and to promote between different environments. So the approach we've taken is to have a, a GitOps repo per environment Developer checks in code that automatically gets propagated to the dev environment. Pipelines will uh, deploy those to a development um, development on OpenShift. Once you're kind of happy with that, we provide a tool called Services Promote, which will uh, collect all the information from the dev repo, propagate that into the production repo, and then trigger another set of pipelines to deploy. Uh, we also use this tool called Customize, which is now baked into kubectl itself. And that allows us to, to tailor the configuration uh, through overlays. And so things like the number of instances you would like, uh, that, can be, that can be altered between development and production environment without having to change uh, the application itself. It's all underpinned by another concept we're introducing called service binding. Um, so service binding is an open specification which both Red Hat and IBM and a number of vendors have been collaborating on, uh, working to define and working to provide services which are coherent too, so that people know how to connect to them. And it basically enables the dynamic discovery 
and configuration of microservice to microservice and microservice to backend service. How does it work? So if we look at an example, so this is a very, very simple topology. I have microservice A, microservice B, which have a dependency on microservice C. Um, if you're familiar with OpenShift and Kubernetes, this might be a, a typical location for those microservices. Uh, storefront dev is the name of my namespace. Uh, it's exposing on microservice A, microservice B are exposing on port 3000 because they're Node.js and that's their default. Um, microservice C is Java, exposes on 9080. Um, so if you were to connect to these, you would usually need to know that up front. Um, and that means that you end up, you can actually code that into your application, but it means that you end up very tightly coupled. Um, or ideally, you would want to be able to do it dynamically. And the way that we can do this, so this is a, a, truncan, a truncated version of our deployment configuration for microservice C. And the addition that I've highlighted here um, is this statement, which basically says, I am going to provide an open API, so a, a REST-based endpoint for other microservices to connect to. Uh, and the effect of that is that we use it to create what's called um, a secret. And this is a way of basically passing configuration around. And within that secret, we put the, the full address for the microservice, including its port, and potentially any, any operational or optional context. So if you wanted to say, respond to V2, because you're using V2 of the API, all of that can be put into the secret. Uh, microservice C creates this, and it's basically a container of configuration on how to connect to it. Uh, so what microservice A now does, um, so this is, for example, an OGS front end that wants to connect to C. In its deployment, YAML, it adds a consumes statement, which says, I'm looking for something called microservice C, which exposes a rest point. Uh, and basically says, give me that secret. So we take it, we inject it into microservice A. Uh, by default, we do this through setting up some environment variables uh, so that the application can read from those variables and knows how to connect to microservice C. The same secret can be injected into microservice B. Uh, what's important is that they no longer need to know in advance the location for that microservice C. Instead, they're dynamically discovering it by stating that they consume microservice C. And this is useful for when you start to move um, where that microservice is located. So for example, if I move microservice C to a staging environment and it suggests now changes, I don't have to change anything in microservice A or B because that, that discovery and that connection is all handled through the secret. That's microservice to microservice discovery. Um, with databases, it's, it's a slightly different process, but effectively works in the same way. Um, we use something called the service binding operator. Um, and microservice C will create a service binding request. Uh, the first part of this, the backing service selector, uh, basically asks to look up for a particular service and for a secret to be created if it doesn't already exist. Uh, and within that secret, just as before, it, it puts the full address for the database. But what it also adds is the credentials that are required on how to connect to that database. So the reason this is an advantage is because the alternative is you would have to either store this within the application source code or within the application configuration in the GitOps repository. Uh, and generally it's, it's accepted that storing credentials in this way is a bad idea. And I think we've seen a number of recent exploits of this, which have been very public. Uh, so that's the that's the secret created for the backend service. The next step is to sort of say which which microservice actually needs this. Uh, so within the application selector, we're saying that this is required by microservice C, and that will then get the secret and have that information injected in the same way as before. So with the combination of service binding and producers consume statements, we now have full dynamic discovery and configuration for both microservice to microservice and microservice to backend service. And this allows for true portability of applications through different environments. 
So I'd now like to stop sharing the presentation and instead, if the demo gods are with me, we will share a live demo. Just give me one moment. I'm going to assume everyone can see my screen, so please shout if you can't. In the purposes of transparency, I'm going to set up an entirely new GitHub organization um, just to show that I'm not cheating. And introduce you to Solution Builder. I'll make it a little bit bigger so that hopefully you can see it. So this is a tool that we use to design application topologies. As I mentioned, it includes reference architectures uh, that we have collaborated with the IBM Garage on. Um, this one, Coffee Shop, was actually from a collaboration with Red Hat in how to explore the difference between uh, REST-based microservices and Reactive. And it uses Quarkus as well as OpenLiberty. Uh, we have Storefront, which is a simple REST e-commerce solution uh, with web BFF pattern for backend microservices, which connect to their own respective data stores. Well, as I say, you can start from scratch. Uh, we provide three components at the moment, REST microservices, uh, reactive microservices, and a database. I can click and drag them into a topology just to make it easier to drag them together. Uh, so in this one, I'm going to have a reactive front end, a reactive back end, and a REST back end. And that reactive back end is going to connect to this uh, Postgres database. So I can say within my reactive front end what topic I want to produce messages on. I can drag the connection between that uh, front end to a back end. This will automatically receive the information for that topic. Um, I can add bindings so that I can connect my reactive backend to a database. Um, in the same way, I can add a binding to connect my reactive front end to a REST backend. You can give the components different names. You can choose on the base set of technology stacks. So if you didn't want to use Java Open Liberty, you could use Spring Boot. Um, you could use Node.js, you could use Quarkus. Um, and within the blueprint itself, you can give the application a name and you can provide uh, some choices on how you want to do GitOps and how you want to configure Kafka should you be using that, um, which we automatically include if you start to include reactive components. So I'm going to start with um, Coffee Shop. I'm going to save this as my own version. I'm going to tell it to go to my newly created GitHub organization. Uh, I'm only going to create a dev GitOps environment for now, and everything else I am going to leave as default. Just going to save all that. And once I click generate, what that will do is, is scaffold out um, those GitHub uh, repos and the GitOps repos that I was talking about earlier. So I just need to give it my token. I'm just going to quickly grab my key. So you can see it start to generate and you can expand each of these nodes to see what it's doing. Um, so basically what this is doing is creating the repos and then populating them with uh, scaffolded out applications. Um, which already have the appropriate configuration so that they are deployable to OpenShift and that they know how to connect to each other once they are. It shouldn't take too long for these ones as I have done them fairly recently and it caches um, most of them. There we go. So if I go back to my GitHub organization, do a refresh. You can see the, the three microservices that have been created and the GitOps repo. So I can now quickly show you what the development experience will be like as well.
Let's make sure that's empty. I'm going to clone one of the, the microservices and open it up in VS Code. So within this, we have a very simple application. Um, the, the base for a REST microservice basically just spits out a dummy Hello World page, as well as the operational um, capabilities such as um, microprofile metrics, in this case, uh, open API and um, what else does it have? All the deployment configuration, which we can see here. The important thing though is, is as shown in the diagram, it has this provide statement so that it it is showing that I I provide a REST API um, and other microservices can connect to me. So that's a very quick demo of how quickly it is to get everything set up and running. Um, I am going to go back to the presentation now, I believe. Um, I just want to kind of like summarize what, what we've just seen. So the capabilities that we provide in accelerators allow for multidisciplinary teams to to design applications based on best practice reference architectures and compose solutions of connected microservices and backend services uh, in Solution Builder. This can be used to automate the development or automate day zero with all the required source code repos being set up, all the required configuration for uh, easy deployment to Kubernetes and OpenShift, uh, how to connect those microservices together. Um, and GitOps is provided as a way to have a single source of truth for your for your deployments on OpenShift, which makes it a lot easier for operations to control and very easy to recreate should there be a sort of like disaster recovery situation. Um, the application stack capabilities that are provided as part of Cloud Pack for Apps mean that uh, those scaffolded applications already have uh, health checks for Kubernetes restarts. And they already have uh, Prometheus metrics included, uh, open tracing, performance dashboards, which can be visualized in Grafana. Um, and the applications also show up logically um, within OpenShift Topology Viewer. Um, the approach that we have taken when Cloud Pack for Applications is designed to help you meet the twin challenges of both deliver faster, retain governance, make sure that you're you're using pre-approved application stacks, um, but all of this is based on open standards and open technology with, crucially, enterprise level support. Thank you very much for listening. That has, that has been a, a lot of me talking, but hopefully not, not too long, and we have got some time for questions, so I'd like to stop sharing now. Thank you, David. That was great. And I'm so happy that the demo worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you talked a lot about, um, well, first of all, you said it's 4.2 tech preview for accelerators for teams. Um, and just for people that are watching, that's 4.2 version of Cloud Pack for applications, not OpenShift 4.2. Um, Correct. So, so Cloud Pack for Applications 4.2 includes OpenShift 4.4. And when are you moving to other versions? So when does 4.3 come out, I guess, is better? Uh, so Cloud Pack for Applications is on a, um, a quarterly release cycle, typically. Um, so if you follow that, that train of thought, it would, it would be third quarter when you see a new update. So does that mean what you've shown tech preview will now be GA in third quarter? Because it's, it's um, great. Not necessarily. So the reason that we've we've put this out as tech preview is, is really to show uh, the intent and the journey that we're on. But we want to make sure that we can really f get feedback from our customers um, to inform the design decisions early on. Because 
there's some things that we we kind of know is in, inherently we will need to add or new features that we will need to add, but we'd like to hear from our customers um, where they want to draw the line between what is a developer's concern, what is an operational concern, um, what configuration do they need to um, declare upfront when designing solutions and how can we best help them. Uh, so we're already engaging with a number of our uh, advisory board clients on this, uh, but we wanted it in the hands of developers and architects as soon as possible, which is why, which is why it's take preview now. Can you share with us some um, things that you're hearing from your clients on Azure? Um, so one thing that we saw very quickly is um, how we had designed the the use of Kafka. So we currently have the point-to-point -point connections between reactive microservices. Um, we found that there were, there were some very common patterns where a microservice would produce and consume on the same topic. Uh, we didn't have a way to represent this with the view that we had set up. So we're, we're currently working on a way uh, which mitigates that and the topic can be a sort of shared asset that's viewable in the viewer. Um, we knew some things around securing uh, communication with Kafka, which we currently aren't able to do, um, but a, a near update will be able to do some things along that line. Um, we are hearing that a lot of folks have their own their own application stacks that would like to bring in, so we're looking at how we can make this tool potentially more flexible. Um, yeah, there's a number of very early requirements that we've had that um, are really exciting for us because it shows us that that appetite in what we're doing. Sorry, I muted myself so I could listen to you. Um, <laughs> as you see, the, uh, you're showing us the journey, which is great. How do you see the journey going? You know, more, how do you see cloud native development and what you're working on and GitOps? Where do you see the future going? Um, I'd actually ask, like to ask that question of Chris if he can if he can share his views there. Hang on, yeah. hang on, just a second. I'm getting oh, which Chris? Sorry, go ahead, Chris <laughs> Bailey. You yeah. have too many Chris's. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Chris. Yeah, sure. So um, th there were a couple of foundational pieces that um, you know, you really need to start being able to to build complex solutions and manage them at scale. Um, so that was bringing in things like GitOps so that you have a, a multi-component um, management system. Um, it was bringing in service binding, um, which makes it possible for us to, to migrate applications between environments. Um, that's kind of a, a foundational basis. Um, but um, you know, so, so service binding is something that we now need to drive out through the community to get all of the, the providers of operators um, making that possible. Now, one of the things you'll then see in Solution Builder is that we'll start to dynamically read um, from the installed set of um, operators that implement service binding as a set of services and capabilities that you'll be able to use in Solution Builder. So the capabilities you'll be able to use will start to, to match um, what you've got available in your, in your OpenShift install. But going beyond that, we'll start to, to look at some of the non-functional concerns. And by that, I mean things like security. So as David said, um, in Solution Build today, we work with Streamsy as the implementation of Kafka, um, but it lays down um, a, an unsecure Kafka. Um, and that's because um, we don't yet know what the security requirements would be for the application. So one of the things you'll see us start to do in the future is um, allow you to configure security policies. Um, so should all of the traffic on a, a Kafka topic or between two REST-based microservices be encrypted um, and do certificate exchange? So, so we kind of got this, this foundational set of capabilities, but in the future it's going to become more about the richer set of components you can use, the more complex applications, um, using you know, greater sets of services, and then being able to start securing those um, starting to potentially add um, requirements that you want to have in terms of performance um, and understanding what your performance criteria is um, and building custom dashboards. So all of the components we lay down today are already you know, health check and metrics enabled, uh, but you still have to build your own dashboard. 
Um, the fact that we know the components you've got in Solution Builder, we know the services that you're using like Kafka, we can actually automatically build custom dashboards that represent all of your microservices, uh, represent you know, the topics that are, are, are um, being used in Kafka, giving you an application level dashboard. And if you tell us things like um, performance requirements, then we can start to overlay um, you know, uh, alert manager to alert you when uh, SLAs are being missed or you know, um, for uptime or, or performance criteria at the front end. And then I'm going to assume other day two operations. And then also, um, you know, you mentioned high availability earlier. Um, so more of those enterprise grade features. Yeah, absolutely. The, the aim is to try and you know, let that solution architect define not just the topology, but the requirements on the solution and help them make that true. Yeah, I think that's something that we've we've seen start to evolve a lot over the years in terms of like the X as code approach. So we talk about GitOps as configuration of code, but we're already seeing solutions around like compliance as code. Um, and ultimately being able to, to store that decision in a way that can, can be policy enables a much, much faster delivery cycle, certainly. And it kind of couples with that idea of, of shift left, where if you can, you can already put these concerns up front in the development life cycle. You're, you're much faster and you don't have the more costly discovery and remediation when it comes later down the line. Hey, Chris Short, I know you wanted to jump in too. You're welcome to. <laughs> you had no, I'm good now. Thank you, Chris Bailey, for chiming in. I appreciate that. Thank you. No, that's, um, I mean, that's great to hear the direction that you are going, especially all the enterprise grade and security. I know we would love to focus more on security as well. And I've heard you talk a lot about collaboration with Red Hat, um, such as service binding um, and other teams. And also um, the Tecton, you mentioned OpenShift pipelines now. So what are your thoughts on serverless or service mesh and other technologies that are coming out? Yeah, um, certainly since the acquisition of Red Hat, what we've seen is um, Red Hat obviously stay an entirely independent organization and that has been really critical to the growth of the OpenShift platform. Um, but what it has allowed for is for IBM really to, as I say, like double down on the capabilities that are provided there um, and to reduce the overlap that we've seen or the competition that we've seen where necessary. So, for example, things like um, Knative uh, as a way of doing uh, serverless deployments of containerized applications. We, we started by shipping our own version of Knative, and now we work very closely with Red Hat on Red Hat Serverless. So we leverage that capability instead. Um, in the same way we used to, well, I believe we used to use our own Istio, and now we use Red Hat Service Mesh instead, and starting to integrate things like Kiali. So yes, there's, there's, definite, there's definite collaboration and consolidation, I guess, um, because for us that, that allows us to build value on top of that rather than be producing something that is fundamentally the same. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's the trend that's gonna continue to grow. And we're already looking at um, the new runtime such as Quarkus, which is obviously a great, a great choice for serverless Java. Chris, any additional yeah, thoughts? And, well, uh, yeah, just, um, just to say that one of the things that we did in the, the runtime component operator, you know, which is how we deploy and manage these services, is we made the use of uh, Knative and OpenShift serverless a, a deployment decision. Um, so all of those microservices are already ready to be used using OpenShift serverless. Um, and all you have to do is in the, the app deploy.yaml, so your, your Kubernetes configuration for deployment, you can set a single flag um, to true, and that will deploy it as a uh, an OpenShift serverless service rather than as a you know a, a regular uh, Kubernetes pod. Um, so we built that in in from day one because you know, serverless is something that's going to be coming increasingly more important over time. So everything that we we kind of lay out and we built, um, we, we kind of said that 
Um, if you car treat serverless as a, a scaling policy, right, what you're saying is you want to scale on demand from zero up to however many requests you've got and then back to zero afterwards. So it's a scaling policy. You could also have a scaling policy that said, I want to have six replicas. Um, so that's the way we represented it in, in the runtime component operators configuration. You choose whether or not you want to have a scaling policy that is serverless or whether you want to have a static number of replicas or replicas plus pod auto scaling. So how has it been working with um, open source? I know you have before in the past, but you know, now diving further into it. So I, I would certainly say for, for large parts of IBM, it's no different um, because we've been doing it for, for 10 or 15 years. Um, I don't think there's, there's a single project that I've worked in in IBM that is not now open source. Um, the first project I worked on that wasn't was um, IBM's implementation of Java. Uh, but that became open source through OpenJ9 and in, in the Eclipse ecosystem. Um, so I think pretty much every line of code I've ever worked on in IBM is, is an open source. Um, so for, for large swathes of IBM, um, it's been no different. Um, and in fact, you know, the, the fact that we've been collaborating with Red Hat on things like service binding on GitOps and so on, um, the fact that, you know, um, there was an acquisition, actually it's not going to change the approach because all of this collaboration has been done through open source communities. Um, and you know, for a lot of the things, so Tekton, for example, um, now OpenShift pipelines, um, same with things like Istio, you know, IBM and Red Hat were already collaborating through those open source communities. Um, so in a lot of ways, things haven't really changed. You know, we're still collaborating, but then we did before. So it was kind of a leading question because I've seen a lot of the collaboration, especially, you know, runtimes and other teams and upstream projects. And it's just, it's always amazing seeing everybody work together, you know, in the open fashion and seeing it better both you know, cloud packs for applications as well as the platform, the OpenShift container platform. So, absolutely. Yeah. And I had other questions. Hey, Chris, do you have any other questions in the stream? Chris Short. Uh, no, <laughs> do not. Sorry. That sounds good. Okay. Those were most of my questions, too. Is there anything else that you would like our, our audience to understand about uh, Packful application, applications or your direction or even any technical information? Because we have a lot of technical people that watch this. I think um, I've certainly spoken enough that my voice is going. <laughs> uh, I've, I will let Chris add anything that I've missed. Um, I, I, I think that the only thing to, to kind of end with is, you know, as Dave has said, um, what's out there in terms of, you know, solution accelerators, solution builder, and so on, it, it's there as a tech preview. Um, you know, our intent is to continue to build on it. Um, and it's like any open source community or any, you know, tech preview product, the more feedback that we get from users, um, the more we can do to build something that actually does what users want it um, to do. So um, I encourage you to kind of uh, reach out to myself, David, through whatever um, form works best, you know, whether that's email, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, through any of the open source communities that we work in um, and, and give us some feedback. I'll just, Perfect. I'll put my, um, well, our contact details, both email and and Twitter on the screen now. So if anyone does want to get in touch, please do. Thank you. And uh, some final thoughts too. You mentioned the service binding collaboration. Uh, the hour right before this one is the developer open office hours. And next week at the hour right before this one <laughs> is going to be service binding. So um, open office hours on service binding. So anybody that wants to join that um, also. And commons.openshift.org 
who want to join the, op the OpenShift Commons community, and this will be po posted on the OpenShift Commons YouTube channel, as well as all the streaming services. So thank you again, very much appreciate you joining us today and sharing all your insight. No problem, thank you very much for having us and giving us the opportunity.